Okay, we're good. All right, so uh, my topic for today, I chose it because we always talk about uh, pathogen. We always talk about uh, uh, the diseases that we have, and uh, we never talk about ourselves or the host. So uh, uh, we're, I don't know if this is working. Okay, there you go. So uh, technically, we're, today we're going to talk about if anybody watched this movie, War, War of the Worlds. Uh, spoiler, alert, spoiler alert! We're going to talk about how how did Tom Cruise and humanity at that in that movie uh, uh, survive and the aliens perished. Uh, so, okay, this is not okay. Alrighty. So uh, the objectives for this talk. Uh, I kind of collected some uh, all, all that information that sounded uh, or seemed uh, uh, pertinent to me uh, in regards to our immune system, and I kind of uh, uh, made it uh, as to what was pertinent from an ID standpoint. Because if you're going to look at the, all the immunology, it's very, very it's a, it's a whole science. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about genetics and infectious diseases. Uh, and then uh, just look at the components uh, of the immune system that we have, adaptive and innate immune s systems. And then uh, throughout the talk, as we're going through the sections, we're going to talk about how some pathogens interact with us and how uh, we, uh, uh, they sometimes overcome the barriers that we have or the immunity, etc. And then uh, finally, we're going to talk a little bit, something that I uh, chose because it's more board relevant, uh, and uh, we certainly had some questions in the uh, in service about it. So uh, some immune deficiency syndromes that uh, that are uh, important, and I couldn't go, go through all of them because there's so many. So I chose probably the most uh, relevant ones, also that were they came up in the board review as well. So uh, without further ado, um, briefly I'm going to talk about this is a, a study that was done uh, very. I, I like the, the, the setup of it. So they compared uh, adopted children to uh, the premature death rates and the causes with their uh, biological parents and with their adopted parents who adopted them. So uh, premature death being uh, 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 someone dies before age 50. And they compared all cause bit mortality between both so adopted and biological parents with their kids and uh, so all cause cardiovascular de death from infectious diseases and uh, from natural causes so surprisingly enough we always hear about cardiovascular risk how it's a lot of a lot of it is genetic but if you look at the the first two red uh, uh, red highlighted uh, uh, parts there you see that uh, if, a, your bio, if the biological parents died from, prematurely from an infectious cause, the relative risk of the, uh, the, the biological children to die prematurely from an infectious cause is 5.8. And, and the cardiovascular and, uh, risk, death risk is 4.5. So it's actually dying from an infectious cause is more genetic than even cardiovascular, which was surprising to me that I never thought of it that way. And uh, um, um, we, we spent most of the time, if not all the time, we don't really talk about family history and infectious diseases, but it might be worth your while if you ask, hey, did anybody die of an infection prematurely in your family? So that's number one, the first point I wanted to make. There you go. And that's uh, the second most relevant, probably, study that I found was that uh, uh, we, starting the bottom left, we know the conventional primary immune deficiencies. We know that there are certain genes, certain uh, uh, group of genes that encode a certain protein receptor, uh, cytokine, etc. And we know there's uh, the, so that's the number of genes, as you can see here, is very limited, but we know what uh, uh, the infectious agents are more, uh, we know them more as opposed to the poly, polygenic predisposition, which is uh, really the, the risks, for example, in Southeast Asia, TB, India, the, the um, 
the uh, tall, thin, white women getting NTM infections. So these are the poly, the groups of genes and the makeup of, of a person and their susceptibility to, G, to infections. And these are some of the examples. Some of them are kind of not identified yet. And uh, you can look through them. Uh, I think that was uh, important. I don't know why the screen is funny. Uh, so uh, going through the immune system, to your left is are the the, the the organs of the immune system. Not going to go through them, and the innate and adaptive immune system, which we're going to talk about now. Um, host defense mechanisms. They're just conventionally divided into innate and adaptive. They do interact um, closely and uh, um, and uh, um, and and throughout. It's a continuum of of, in, of interaction with the pathogens. So uh, the innate immune system. It's you think of it of a sh as a shield, however, as a physical barrier, but turns out, as we're going to see, that it's way more than that. It has a lot of uh, small things that were and continue to be discovered. It's uh, nonspecific. It defends uh, our, it defends, it's a, it's a continuous defense mechanism that we have, includes, uh, includes uh, our skin, our mucous membranes, our reflexes sometimes, our, even aversion is an innate immune system uh, quality, so you don't eat things that smell bad or stuff like that. Uh, the initial inflammatory response is mediated by the innate immune system, and it's kind of the, the, the link that, uh, that, that uh, combines or connects both conventionally divided uh, uh, immune systems. So the adaptive immune system, more specific, more, uh, I, I thought of it as more the, more of the, like the, the moving parts of our immune system. It, uh, it has a delayed appearance and it's followed, it, it, the response of the immune system is the adaptive immune system needs um, something to trigger it. And then if that trigger is gone, usually it wanes away. So think of it as your special forces in, the, in your body that, that need, whenever something that cannot be handled by the innate immune system, that they come in and when they're done, they're done. And then uh, it's divided into humoral and cell-mediated immunity, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So um, as we talked about, it's not just the physical barrier, the innate, general, non-specific immune system. It, uh, it's, it, it, uh, it has intact skin, mucous membranes, as we talked about. Uh, the micro, micro, microbicidal peptides, mucus, ciliary movements, our cough reflexes, sneeze, sneezing, peristalsis. If you uh, you're in like food poisoning, you actually throw up what you had just to, because you don't want to keep it go to go through through uh, throughout your um, immune system. And uh, relatively recent, not very recent addition was the uh, microbiome that we have. Uh, mainly in the GI tract, but as we will see, it's kind of, we're getting to know it more and more in different areas in the GI, but the major uh, factor is the GI tract. Uh, we do have, uh, it was thought we had like 10 times more uh, bacteria than cells, now it's like two to three times. So uh, lysozymes complement as well, so it's all innate immune system. Very briefly, I'm gonna talk just about uh, some parts. Uh, the skin, mechanical barrier, intertwined uh, epithelial cells, um, cur keratinized layers of some dead tissue and then the, the dead cells. And then uh, on top of it, you have your defensive mechanisms. Even if on an intact skin that is dry, there are de uh, detected, detectable levels of, uh, of this, uh, these chemicals, peptides, lysozymes that have microbicidal effects, defensins, there's a huge list actually close to 40 of them, which I didn't want to go through because it's just random names that we're <laughs> going to understand. So, um, and then the relative dryness, mild humidity of the skin is also considered one of our defense mechanisms. There you go. Uh, one of the most common things that we see, one of Dr. Green's questions is uh, atopic dermatitis. So it's not just a f breaking the physical barrier, it's also we have de decreased levels of these defensive proteins, peptides on our skin, which uh, makes you more, uh, more susceptible to uh, eczema, like for if you have herpes, eczema herpeticum with super, uh, super infections in uh, impetigo and so forth, and that's a case. 
There you go. Um, going down to mucous membranes, same thing, structure, the junctions, the desmosomes, hemidesmosomes that prevent the uh, penetration of bacteria or pathogens into the uh, subcut subcutaneous or subepithelial tissue. Uh, same thing with the peptides, enzymes, mucus, and you see part of the uh, uh, adaptive immune system kind of also intertwining here with the secretory uh, immunoglobulins, the IgA mainly, some IgG. And uh, uh, you have your iron binding proteins. Here only I'm going to focus on uh, the iron binding proteins where, where uh, it looks like this is a very old um, defense mechanism because ba uh, iron is very important to all bacteria and all living things technically. This is a really nice, this is the best uh, paper that I found is very clear, kind of make things, makes uh, things clear. The battle for iron between uh, bacteria, pathogens, and their hosts. So uh, that's, A is normal tissue. You have your hemoglobin, the iron in the heme particles in the red blood cells, the ferritin inside the epithelial cells, and transferrin, which is present, transfers the iron, tra makes it scarce for the, for the bacteria to take, uh, to take it up. So bacteria have evolved a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, ways here, means of uptaking this iron from, uh, from, our, from us or the, their hosts. Uh, they have, uh, so whenever there's an inf inflammation or infection, the epithelial cells get damaged, ferritin gets out. Uh, they have ferritin, transferrin, and heme receptors. They have something that's called siderophores, which they secrete. And what they do is that they, they uptake the free iron and even have more affinity iron from our heme and uh, the, our ferritin. Um, we top that one with, uh, with a, something called siderocalin, which is more, has more affinity and binds the siderophores. And then bacteria came up with stealth siderophores that have even more affinity. So, and they're not detectable by our uh, defense mechanisms. And same thing is hemophores in some bacteria. Most common infections in iron overload, we know the liver, the bugs, the listeria, Yersinia, Aeromonas, uh, Mucor, Mycosis, and the Vibrio, of course. Respiratory tract, um, the aerodynamics of uh, breathing that makes it hard for larger pathogens to get into our uh, lower respiratory tract, uh, humidification. Some bacteria actually increase their their size, and it's kind of a, a also a, it makes it more difficult for them to get get uh, get again into the lower respiratory tract. Mucociliary blanket, cough, sneezing, and the alveolar mac macrophages and histiocytes. Um, everything is uh, of course hindered by smoking, and uh, when you have any. Uh, um, Genetic issues, bronchiectasis, CF, that's how they, the, this mechanism is kind of broken. All right. Okay. Um, gastrointestinal tract, of course, the acidity of the pH of the stomach. I was very disappointed. Uh, my favorite bug, the water bear or tardigrades, <laughs> which uh, are very resilient. They are resistant to high pressures, high temperatures, uh, ionizing radiation, uh, vacuum, space. They were fine, but apparently they don't survive stomach acidity. So uh, enzymes, of course, the GI enzymes. And then you have the uh, microbiome, finally, which I'm not going to go into because it's its, it's, its own lecture, I guess. And the GU tract. We had thought that uh, good urine is sterile urine, but apparently that's not the case. There's a lot of the times where uh, with the new techniques of detecting pathogens that uh, multiple, multiple, multiple papers have uh, talked about this um, with PCR techniques and like ribosomal detections, uh, the bacteria that we cannot really culture are present in about like 5 to 10% of the population, which is not even symptomatic. So that's being studied now to see if there's any, anything we can benefit from it from a therapeutic or prophylactic uh, 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 way. But I think it's, it's probably too early as of now yet. Um, in diabetes, 
definitely a higher risk of pyelonephritis. It is thought because uh, it is thought to be because of uh, uh, the um, usually it's a in the kidney medulla and uh, we have a hypotonic state, which is defense mechanism because it's not favorable for bacteria. What happens in diabetes is that you secrete your uh, sugar in your urine and it and it, it reverses that so that's why it was thought to have an uh, increased risk um, innate immunity and inflammation this is kind of uh, once the physical barriers the shield is broken into by bacteria what happens is that we kind of start things start getting more serious so it's a lot of the times only sim simply numbers of bacteria can uh, infiltrate the innate immune system. Sometimes it's just a small scratch. Sometimes it's a, uh, sometimes some bacteria have a elusive uh, uh, mechanisms, a tick bite or whatever it is that introduces uh, the, the, the bacteria beyond the, the tract, the protective shield, I guess. So when, once there's a breach, there's a, there's, there are, we have response proteins trigger molecules and effector molecules. Trigger molecules all are the beginning of the call for arms for the adaptive immune system. Uh, we have pathogen associated uh, molecular patterns and damage associated uh, molecular patterns, which are basically um, the most common bacteria that we evolved throughout time to recognize our, our immune system um, ha and, and these are detected by the toll-like receptor families on a lot of our cells, which we're going to talk briefly about, uh, and, uh, and that's how you initiate the response. And then the effector molecules is after, after you, uh, after we, we the trigger, mo mo what, what happens after the trigger molecules are, are, are activated. So these are your uh, chemokines and chemotaxis mediators. Uh, Toll-like receptors, they're actually preserved in all mammals and uh, they have been around and actually some of them we don't know what they detect. It's either some um, gene, some pathogens that we haven't detected or we don't know about or they were there in the past and they don't exist anymore. Some of them, uh, so here you have your toll-like receptor too, most, mostly gram-positive, some like uh, trypanosomas, uh, etc. So, and you see that these are Anything that you see a bacteria named to it is the pathogen associated uh, uh, molecular pattern and then host is the damage associated uh, molecular pattern. So that's that. Uh, once after your toll-like receptors detect these, these patterns that still we're still in the innate immune system, what happens is that it, it, it uh, activates your cascade inflammation or whatever the, the target uh, target I guess molecule is, and you have more than 45 chemo chemokines, 11 receptors described, and we're still, we, there are still st things that we don't know what their function is. It's an evolving uh, science. So most famously, we have the inter interleukins that we're actually looking into therapeutic things to exploit, uh, to help us with different cancers, autoimmune diseases, infections. Um, so interleukins so far, there's 33 of them. And you have interferon. Um, in general, uh, they would, um, if you look at the table, I don't like to uh, put everything here. Uh, one, two, four, six, and eight are pro-inflammatory. IL-10 is an attenuator, which is a downregulator. IL-12 is, I mentioned it because it, it's relevant later on with the <coughs> IL-12 receptor deficiency, immune uh, deficiency syndrome. And it's a, it's a pro-inflammatory, but it works by inhibiting IL-10, so it inhibits the inhibitor, it's a pro. All right, so um, most common chemokine receptor is the CCR5 receptor, which we know from our uh, HIV studies that if, if, uh, if it's mutated, it uh, confers uh, an incomplete HIV resistance because the virus uses it to enter your host cells. However, Apparently, if you completely lost it, if it didn't exist, and some people do have that, it has an increased risk of symptomatic West Nile virus, which was interesting. And uh, 
made, made you think, actually, if you block it, are you increasing your risk for West Nile? And apparently they did it, that study, and they found that it's, it's not, it doesn't do anything. So it looks like if you don't have it at all, that's when you, uh, you have the increased risk. All right. There you go. Uh, how some bacteria evade the, the innate immune system. We have the uh, H. pylori, Coxiella, Legionella, Rhizobium, even Candida and PCP, they just change their structure. Uh, some of them change it more than once, some of them just once. Uh, some species are different and we just uh, don't detect them anymore. So as simple as that. Uh, something that was very interesting I found is uh, the Trypanoma cruzii and it's actually something that's probably we're I think we're going to hear about soon. Uh, so apparently, in, so macrophages after they uh, they uh, uptake the organism, they either destroy it and go the apoptosis uh, route, and they just kind of cellular death, which is controlled and it's actually uh, anti-inflammatory. So that it attenuates everything. Says, hey, I killed the organism. I'm fine. Let's let's uh, let's calm down as opposed to if it gets necrosed. So if the pathogen actually blows it up on the, from the inside and it doesn't, it's not a, it's, it's not a controlled cellular death or apoptosis, it's pro-inflammatory and it makes, it more, makes more inflammation, more, calls more arms to the site. So uh, Trypanosoma cruzii apparently targets the apoptotic macrophages and says, hey, come here, I'm, eat me and it, it evades the, the, the actual healthy macrophages. So uh, what happened is that uh, they, they uh, injected some uh, apoptotic cells in mice with trypano T. crucii and the parasitemia was overwhelming in, 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 the, in a very short period of time. And on the other hand, they used uh, COX inhibitors and the parasitemia almost in vitro, uh, in vivo in mice completely went away. And now there's a lot of uh, uh, recent trials about use of aspirin in preventing cardiovascular damage in uh, in uh, in uh, Trypanosoma cruzii. So, so I thought that was interesting, and that's very recent, like a year ago. Uh, All righty. So uh, just a summary: continuous passive innate immune system, uh, evolutionary. As you can see, we share it with all mammals with toll-like receptors and all that. Um, it defends more than 90 or sometimes 99% of all infections. If you think about it, you're all, we're all exposed at all times. Um, possible exploitable properties for therapeutics, as we saw, and uh, it enter, it's, it's a very closely linked to the adaptive uh, immune system. Adaptive immune system, as we talked about, it's uh, humoral immunity and cell-mediated, cellular immunity. So humoral immunity, it's pretty much the antibodies antibodies that we have, they're uh, produced by uh, beta B lymphocytes discovered in the late, uh, late 1800s. They're called gamma globulins because they just, on the electrophoresis of, uh, of our serum, it just has a, the spike in the third, third area. This is alpha 1, alpha 2, that's beta, that's gamma. And uh, they're responsible for mostly the extracellular defense. All right. And that's the structure, I'm not going to go into it much, but it has uh, two fab ends, the FC, which is the crystalline, it's the it's a, a, a common one between the, an the antibodies, different types. Uh, C1Q is the first member of the complement cascade, and you have two heavy chains, two light chains, and based on that you get your uh, different subtypes. You have IgM, IgA, IgD, E, and G. G is the most abundant in the body. IgM is the, uh, the, the one that has more, the most sites. As you can see, it's five molecules. The IgA is the secretory. IgE is the different one because it binds, it doesn't bind antigen. It, it doesn't bind antigens. It binds uh, mast cells, as we know, and IgD. There you go. Just major differences. Um, half-life, as you can see, IgG is the most, has the most, uh, the highest ha half-life. Uh, the concentration is also IgG is the highest. It, it, this all changes if there's like an acute infection. We know IgM goes higher, etc. There's a, a 
the, the ratios also di are different in some immune deficiencies if they're higher or lower. Uh, crosses the placenta, we know only IgG does, and then uh, uh, the mast cells and uh, complement is only IgG, IgM. All right, so what is the importance of immunoglobulins? We know that they block neutralized pathogens and toxins. Uh, we use them for diagnostic purposes. Some back, we, we, we look at the antibodies and the responses. Uh, immune deficiencies, we, we measure it and uh, we, we figure things out as we, we're gonna see in a little bit. And then in treatment, uh, passive immunizations, if someone needs antibodies acutely, such as uh, rabies, CMV, and transplant, some snake bites, parvovirus B19, uh, we replace them also uh, if someone has uh, low immunoglobulins. And, all right. Um, what if you had too much antibodies? Um, that's your gamma gap, it's called. Chronic infections such as HIV, malaria, infective endocarditis, trypanosomiasis. Uh, MGUS is where we don't know if it's significant or not and uh, uh, multiple myeloma lymphoproliferative diseases is when, uh, uh, when you have uncontrollable um, uh, um, monoclonal mono production of some uh, antibodies from uh, uh, malignancy. And then uh, we have the hyper IgD syndrome is the basically uh, thought, it's a periodic fever syndrome where uh, as most periodic you can, you, uh, fever syndromes, it's, it results from the uh, amount of IgD that causes chronic inflammation and fevers and you don't have a, uh, um, so whenever you have a fever of unknown origin and there's nothing else going on and you have a gamma gap and you ruled everything out, that's what you think about. All right, so, and that was the humoral adaptive immunity. Now the adaptive immunity, the cellular part is, the main key player is your T, T cells. And then the main supporter is the B cells and any antigen presenting cells, which are the dendritic cells and the macrophages. macrophages. Um, there's a huge um, classification of T cells, which I didn't want to go through. The main ones are the t helper T cells or induce, uh, inducers and CD8s, which are the CD4 cells, which we know. And the CD8s are the cytotoxic. Main uh, main things uh, with CD cell, CD uh, with T cells are that um, they have a close relation with the major MHC, the major histo histocompatibility complex, which uh, is kind of wh where they get their targets from. Uh, the intracellular uh, pathogens work with MHC1, and it's a C that presents it to CD8 cells, and that's why they're cytotoxic, any intracellular pathogens. CD4s are extracellular, and they work with MHC2. So, uh, just a couple of uh, couple of examples of, uh, for example, in uh, viruses, what happens in uh, herpes viruses? Um, if there's an, it's an intracellular pathogen, all viruses are. So, what happens is CD4 cells detects the destruction of an infected cells. They call the B, C, B cells. They destroy the, the 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 diseased cells, and the, the viral particles go out. And that's how they present those, uh, path uh, those uh, antigens to our B cells. And the B cells start making antibodies. So the target becomes to just destroy the cells that are, and that are infected and get rid of the, out the, the extracellular virus that's left. Uh, what happens in, in, in uh, latent infections, such as HSV and CMV and all that, uh, what happens is that there's some viral particles remain transcriptionally inactive and uh, they're just latent and there's no way for, they're not expressing their uh, peptides or proteins. So CD8 cells are not detecting anything. So they just stay there until they get reactivated, etc. cetera. Uh, bacteria, intracellular, we're gonna talk because the out, we talked about antibodies. So um, a couple of things that were interesting. Uh, they're divided into phagosomal pathogens and cytoplasmic pathogens. The phagosomal ones are mainly mycobacteria. There's salmonella and a few others. Uh, they, uh, the defense uh, works for, uh, through TNF-alpha and interleukin-12 and interferon-gamma-mediated 
uh, nitric oxide toxicity when they're on the inpatient on the in inpatient side, intracellular side. Uh, the way they evade those uh, those uh, mechanisms by the uh, by uh, preventing the phagosome lysosome fusion. Same thing with the cytoplasma pathogens. They're in the cytoplasma. They're just swimming around. And they just avoid hitting the, the the vacuoles of the phagocytic vacuoles. So Listeria monocytogenes and Shigella, some rickettsial spe species. All right. Other components of the adaptive immune system. We have your complement. You have your mucosal immune responses, which we're not going to talk about. And then last but not least, I'm going to talk about some immune deficiency syndromes. <laughs> uh, most commonly are the iatrogenics, the drugs that we give our patients, the uh, transplant patients, steroids, etc., and then uh, the autoimmune pa patients, of course, that they get uh, uh, immune suppressant medications. Uh, acquired through a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, diseases, diabetes, HIV, asplenia, etc., and then genetic immune uh, deficiencies. And all right, when to think about immune deficiencies? Really, for our boards, is uh, really if someone is on immune suppressant medications, you'll know if they have a case, they'll tell you of like whatever HIV or ACE plenty or something. Uh, what what we probably need to study or I needed to study is, are the genetic ones that we rarely see and probably we under or yeah under diagnose it or we don't think about it as much as we should i don't know i feel i i sh i definitely need, would need a a, a reminder of, of of them especially for the boards so when to when to think about uh, immune deficiency syndromes when you have an abnormal frequency of infections someone who's getting a lot of infections when you have abnormal presentation of regular infections, and when you have unusual infections that really you don't see in someone who's immune competent. Uh, talking about the few ones that, uh, that, uh, that we have the time to talk about. So IgA deficiency is one of the most common immune deficiencies. It's uh, in itself not a pathogenic inf uh, thing, but if you have any small thing, even diabetes or uh, some low risk medications then you'll see a lot of a lot of uh, uh, infections and then you have to wonder you have to rule out anything else that's going on with it so in it in itself it doesn't cause any issues but if there's anything else going on with it you have to think about what's going on in the background and it's detectable by uh, when you get your uh, immunoglobulin panel and it's low all right uh, most commonly uh, asked about question, I guess we had, I think we had this question on our, uh, uh, about CVID, common variable immune deficiency. So recurrent sinus and pulmonary infections, you have your, um, also there was another question about Giardia and uh, Echovirus, uh, so enteric uh, infections, uh, younger age. So diagnosis, you have to have l a low IgG level or subclasses one and three and two or four. If it's just one subclass, usually it's not really, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, you, have, you have to have another, it's like a criteria, you have to have another uh, subtype of IgA that's also deficient and you, have, you can augment your diagnosis with decreased response to immunization. Uh, treatment is just to treat infections and replace your uh, IV, your immunoglobulins. There we go. Uh, Complement deficiencies, most very common question. I think we all know terminal uh, C5 through 9 complements is uh, recurrent Neisseria bacteremia and meningitis. Uh, C1 through 4 is really not an immune deficiency. It's an auto. It 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 it's associated more with uh, like lupus and other autoimmune diseases. Uh, diagnosis: If you're, um, you're usually you can start screening with a CH50, which is a classical uh, complement uh, deficiency uh, marker, and then you can do the su uh, subtypes for which one in particular. And then if you're thinking alternative pathway, it's AH50. So easy to remember. 
uh, treatment, antibiotic suppression sometimes if they're having a lot of infections and you treat the infection and uh, some, some papers suggested hypervaccination with uh, meningitis uh, and pneumonia vaccines. <coughs> Uh, myeloperoxidase uh, deficiencies, autosomal recessive. It's a most common neutrophil abnormality and uh, usually also needs another uh, condition to manifest. Usually skin, soft tissue abscesses, um, and you'll see uh, on, on the uh, path pathology, you actually see the granules. Um, you treat the infections. It's really mainly if you see a diabetic with a very bad candidiasis, you have to think about this. So it's really, you, it's a patholog pathological uh, diagnosis. Uh, Chidiak Higashi syndrome, another autosomal recessive uh, syndrome. It's, uh, uh, the hallmark is recurrent cutaneous, again, sinus pulmonary infection, partial al albinism where you have like a streak of white hair and uh, uh, you have neuropathy if it's uh, advanced and then uh, it, uh, it confers higher risk for lymphoma, HLH-like HLH syndromes. Uh, the diagnosis is uh, you see the giant blue granules uh, on a blood smear and uh, you can do the genetic test. It's the list gene. Prophylaxis with antibiotics, treatment of infection. It's, a treat it's treatable, curable with a b bone marrow transplant. And then CGD, uh, another neutrophil or macrophage uh, 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 disease. It's, X it's X-linked or autosomal recessive leads to a lot of uh, skin soft tissue abscesses, uh, re uh, recurrent, uh, anything that's catalyzed, catalyzed positive, uh, staph aureus, serratia, urticaria, nocardia, so not your usual pathogens. And um, you, you have a chronic uh, staph aureus osteomyelitis, uh, wound, delayed wound infection, uh, uh, surgical wound infections and delayed healing uh, you diagnose it via uh, either the, the, so it's a DH, uh, dihydrorhodamine oxidation through flow cytometry or the, the nitroblue tetrazoleum uh, reduction test. Um, you have to test the family if you identify one case and uh, uh, you, the management is you follow ESR, hypervigilant about uh, monitoring for infections. Uh, prophylactic antibiotics and uh, imaging. Uh, again, you can treat it with a bone marrow transplant. Uh, leukocyte adhesion deficiency, or LAD type one. Um, the the defect is in in uh, the the leukocyte the the PMNs cannot uh, c communicate with the with the they cannot get out of the vessels basically because they're, they're not able to, uh, to use the, the adhesion molecules on the, epithelial cell, on the epith uh, endothelial cells. So you get recurrent necrotizing infections of the skin, perineum, pneumonia, gut, infections with enteric uh, bacteria, delayed umbilical stump separation is, is the, the buzz, buzzword. And then uh, you, the, so the risk, there is always leukocytosis, but the leukocytes are not get, able to come out of the vessels. So that's why there's leukocytosis. And this is a biopsy of a colon with a patient for, with colitis. As you can see, there's, there's a lot of uh, 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 PMNs here, but it's not in the subcutaneous or interstitial tissue. So it's kind of trapped in the blood vessels. And that's what happens. It's a CD18. Uh, a CD18 mutation. You diagnose with a, uh, with a flow cytometry for, for a CD18. Treatment is a bone marrow transplant. Hyper IgE syndrome or jo jobs. Um, don't bring up in here. It's all good. Jobs. I don't know how I say it. All right, there you go. Thank you. Oh, again. I just minimize it. Oh. If it happens again, I, I have a permanent solution. Okay. All right. So, uh, um, oh, wait a minute. 
So it's a hyper production of I IgE. It uh, manifests with the uh, uh, with the wide set eyes, nose, pointy chin, as you can see, and uh, has a lot of. Uh, uh, so that's really the, the the facial changes are the most common ones. You have a lot of eczema, uh, skin boils, pneumonias, uh, and then the rest. Okay. Diagnosis is by elevated uh, IgE, more than 2,000, and then eosinophilia in almost, well, almost all cases, 93%. You treat infection, prophylactic antibiotics, and possibly BMT. Uh, DOC18 uh, uh, defi doc, doc deficiency, it's uh, an autosomal rec recessive. Very similar to Job's. It's, this is, these are the two that you have to, uh, to uh, uh, differentiate in the, in the boards. So really, if you just put them in one compartment in your uh, head. The main thing is viral infections. When they sell, tell you HPV, HSV, or uh, molluscum, really that's that's when you're going to say doc eight and not jobs that's that's the main thing in the questions in the board review uh again high ig low igm uh interferon gamma receptor deficiency um as we should think about uh, in anybody who has uh ntms uh not pulmonary disseminated mainly and tb uh, and you, uh, it's an it's a it's an absent or defective uh, interferon gamma receptor one. You diagnose it through uh, flow cytometry and functional studies, and you treat the infection. And you, it's a, the curative treatment is BMT. Uh, any of those infections can manifest in this uh, in this uh, disease. And usually, they're more severe than usual. Not pulmonary NTM, disseminated. Let's just focus on that. Uh, IL-12 receptor deficiency, similar to interferon gamma because they work on the same pathway. One uh, stimulates the other. Uh, usually milder, same pathogens, and then uh, the diagnostic test is a flow cytometry and functional assays. Uh, this one can be treated with uh, interferon gamma because it's not a an, an receptor problem. And eventually, whenever you're thinking about an immune deficiency, try to think about what do you want to screen for because it's really hard to to differentiate in the real life between them it's not always a board question right so if you're thinking lymphocytes these are your screening tests immunoglobulin levels immunization responses your cd4 uh, levels there's an idiopathic uh, hypo like a D, uh, cd4 deficiency not related to hiv and you have your cytokine production and pro proliferation if you're thinking phagocytes, you do the DHR or nitro, the NBT for the superoxide uh, assays, and you do flow cytometry for the other ones that we talked about. And if you're thinking complement, these are your screening tests as well. And, uh, and uh, I think that was it for the most perfect. <laughs> and that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Yay.